This is Chris Potter, and I'm here today with 1972 World Series MVP, Gene Tennis. Uh, Gene was a member of the Oakland Athletics uh, championship teams from 72, 73, and 74. Uh, Gene's here to tell a story today, uh, a couple stories about uh, Charlie Finley. Uh, Gene, why don't we start with the, uh, the story about your contract? <laughs> well, I'm trying to remember what year it was. I think it was about 74. We were about we were $1,000 apart. And... Uh, I had to file for arbitration, so my case was coming up on a Friday in San Francisco at noon, and he uh, came in town, and uh, we were in a monsoon. It was raining so hard in the Bay Area that he went to this hotel there, it's, not, it's no longer there, called the Edgewater, right across the freeway from the Coliseum, and, and he set up a, an office in there, him and his secretary, Carolyn, and uh, they barricaded this whole area. And uh, of course, nobody was stopping. They were trying to get out, you know, home from that monsoon. So anyway, he calls up my house, gets a hold of me. To make a long story short, he talks to me, and I said, "I got to drive 30 minutes. Take me 30 minutes on a normal condition to get down to this Coliseum." And this particular evening, with that storm, it took me a good uh, 50 minutes to get down there, which was stupid. Anyway, so I went down and I told my, well, called my wife up and I said, uh, I said, I was working at a, at a racquetball club. I said, called my wife and I said, I'm going to go down and you call my agent. He's in San Francisco at the hotel. You tell him we're going to try to work his contract out with the old man. So I get down there, get in there, go in there, and, and there he is. He's got all the tables pushed together like a thing in the office, you know, conference room. <laughs> Telephones all over the place. Carolyn's there, my secretary. And uh, Charlie and I are talking there at baseball, and next thing you know, he pulls out this contract. Throws it down, throws a pin down, and said, Dago, sign that contract. I said, when I looked at it, it didn't have a thousand dollars, I ain't signing that contract. So uh, all of a sudden, I get ready to leave. I said, I'll see you tomorrow in San Francisco. Because you brought me down here in this weather, took a chance of me getting in a wreck. And now you're going to do that to me? I said, no, I'll see you tomorrow in San Francisco. So the phones just started ringing, and Carolyn's yelling at him long distance. So I'm standing up, and he grabs a hold of me and says, don't you leave. You better stay right here, and you better not leave until I get back. So he takes off. He disappears. And, and uh, Carolyn starts talking to me. And uh, she said, you want me to tell you how to get that $1,000 out of Charlie? I figured, you know, they're working against me, both of them, you know, conspiracy. So I said, Terrell, Carol, don't mess with my head. You know, I've got a dump problem with the old man. Now you're going to start on me. I don't need all this. He said, no, no, I'll tell you how to do this. He left it to me. I said, so you still have that St. Bernard? Which I had a huge St. Bernard. I probably weighed 140 pounds or bigger. And I said, yeah, I still got smoky. She said, well, when Charlie comes back, tell him you'll sign a contract and he gives you a year supply for the talk to him. So I started thinking about that. And the more I thought about it, the better I like it, you know. So it, it must have been 20 minutes or so, and uh, Charlie came back, and he sits down there beside me, and he starts talking, small talk, and he reaches in his fork and pulls out this contract, and he throws a pen down again. He says, sign that. There you go. And I said, uh, he said, that it doesn't have a $1,000 in it. I said, Charlie, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sign this contract under one stipulation. He goes, what's that? I said, you give me your supply of dog food for my dog. He didn't hesitate. He said, you got it. So I'll tell you how shrewd a businessman he is. I'm filling out, you know, the boxes and the X and O's and everything, you know. And next thing you know, he grabs a hold of my wrist. And he gets down in my face and he goes, what kind of dog you got? I said, St. Bernard. He grabbed that contract up, folded it up nice and neat, put it in his sport coat pocket. And opened up the other sport coat and it had that thousand dollar raise in it. <laughs> but that gives you an idea of what kind of a, a shrewd businessman Charlie was. Well, he seemed like a character. Uh, from my understanding, he had a mule. Kid. <laughs> yeah, Charlie owned a mule. Yeah, he had this mule, gorgeous mule. I think the governor of Missouri gave him this mule as a gift. I guess it be something else. I would have liked that as a mule as a gift. But it was like their mascot. You know, and he, you know, the thing about that crazy mule, he would take that mule in a hotel. In a hotel? He would walk him right in the lobby of a hotel. He would have the caretaker, you know, handle it. Would take that mule in Oakland and, and, and 
the Hilton, I mean, in a huge hotel. And then they had somebody had to clean up the floor when he got out, before he got out of it, but that was comical. Uh, he had that mule. It was a beautiful, like I said, beautiful mule. And he had this uh, rule, and uh, nobody could ride this mule. There's only one player that he would grant permission to get on the mule that was Dick Green. I never could figure that one out. You know, I mean, I could ride horses, I could ride a mule. But he, he had a rule, like I said, and he was going to charge you a thousand, you going to cost you a thousand dollars if he found out or he saw you on the mule. Well, you know me, I was on a mission to, to, I was going to ride this mule. Well, I, mean, I wasn't worried about the thousand dollars, I didn't think he'd find me anyway, but I'm going to ride this mule. I just wanted to do it. So I think because he told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> so anyway, I set this thing up. It took me two years to kind of, you know, lay the groundwork on how I was going to do this without you know, make a fool out of myself, a much bigger fool out of myself. So anyway, they, on every Sunday they would bring this mule in on day games and uh, they had a $50,000 car and trailer. I wasn't even making $50,000 back then. And this mule was living the best, I think I was more envied a mule than the, you know, the whole thing really came out and down to it. So. And they pulled that trailer in right by our dugout and backed that mule out. So I got Batting practice was over with, and I made a point to get up there and get changed and get back down in the dugout before the mule got to the dugout. So everybody else was in the club. I was getting ready for a game, and I come back down. I'm sitting there waiting. Here comes the mule. And Stanley, the guy that took care of him, uh, backed him out of the trailer. And like, they always took that mule, once they got it out of the trailer, take him down. And the tarp down by past third base, the tarp was up against the rail. And the kids could <coughs> come down there and get on top of the tarp and then they could sit on the mule and then their parents could take pictures of them because the mule was so tall that they, you know, they couldn't keep picking people up, up and down, you know, uh, from, you know so it was easier for them to step on the tarp and then step on the, on the mule. So I was watching this, <laughs> you know, about two years every Sunday, watch this, you know, I'm going to get this uh, mule. So there was a... There was a period there where there was nobody on the mule, so I, I said, okay, this is my time. I got the nerve up. And I took off on a dead sprint out of that dugout, and I'm running down the track, you know, towards the mule. I jumped on top of the tarp and then jumped on the mule and grabbed the reins from the, you know, the guy that was holding <laughs> when them. When I jumped on the mule, it kind of spooked the mule, and he kind of took off, so the reins so I had to grab the reins. Now I've got the mule under control. Here we go around the left field track, and I'm waving at all the people. So I'm making my rounds, of, you know, around right field, center field, right field, and coming on in to the visiting dugout. And now our players are starting to filter down the field, getting really loose enough for the game. So I saw well, that. So I said I need to get the mule back over there, and I need to get, get myself ready for the game. So. I took off from their dugout, of course, and, and walked him across the field behind home plate and got off of it. And, and one of the players got him said, Gino, I said, you got a phone call. He's like, it's calling me. And I go get the phone and it's Charlie. And uh, he's all over me. And he's up in his office, you know, and, and I'm looking around this wall where the phone's at, and I can see him looking up there out of his window, looking straight down at me. And he's yelling at me, and he said he's going to cost me a thousand dollars for riding that mule. But he'd never find me. <laughs> That's just Charlie, just, you know, being Charlie. That's great. Well, uh, you've spent uh, 44 years in Major League Baseball. Uh, parts, uh, you know, with the Oakland Athletics, the St. Louis Cardinals, San Diego Padres. Uh, after your playing career was over, <clears throat> uh, you went on to help manage the Blue Jays. Uh, was there any team that you were a part of? Well, I, Houston, I coached in Houston a couple of years. And then most of my time was obviously in Toronto. I had 10 years there. Uh, and we won two world championships there in 92, 93. But yeah, I was with a, you know, in, in the Cardinal organization as a coach, a hitting coordinator, and uh, worked with catchers. I was with the Red Sox for three years in the minor league system. Also doing the same thing, hitting and catching. Uh, spent a year with the Milwaukee Brewers. That was my first coaching job ever once I got out as a regular player, active player. And then 
had one year with the Yankees. I think everybody had should have one year with the New York Yankees organization. That's what I've heard. I've heard that from most everybody. But uh, that was interesting. And of course, I got to meet Mr. Steinbrenner. But uh, that was kind of neat, though. But pretty much, I spent I don't know what 12, 13 years coaching in the minor leagues, and then probably I had uh, 12, 12 years coaching in the big leagues. And then, you know, on top of 15 years I played at Bristol. Well, you're now officially retired. Uh, how is retired life treating you? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're out here in the beautiful uh, God's country. God's country. Yeah, that's absolutely. It's uh, it's absolutely beautiful out here. We got stuck. In the snow, <laughs> Gina had to come rescue yeah, us. Yeah, you got to have the right equipment if you don't live in Oregon. Uh huh. You know, you got to have the right clothes, and you got to have the right vehicle. Yeah. A van with no four wheel drive or studded tires is not going to get to my house. Well, <laughs> and you and you found that out. <laughs> we absolutely did find that out. Uh, well, this is Chris Potter, and I'm here today with Gene Tennis. Uh, if you'd like to obtain any more information regarding Gene Tennis or obtaining his autograph please visit www.chrispottersports.com. Keen, it was a pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, and thank you for tuning in.